Hello, this is Monica Reinagel, and you're listening to episode number 466 of the Nutrition Diva podcast. Welcome. This has been one of the worst flu seasons in a decade, and there are plenty of nasty coughs and colds going around as well. Is there anything you can do nutrition-wise to bolster your defenses? For example, you may have seen the story that went viral last week claiming that drinking wine can keep you from getting the flu. Alas, this was another example of headline writers run amok. In fact, after I posted their original headline, which was, quote, drinking wine will stop you from getting the flu, end quote, as a particularly egregious example, the UK's Independent updated their headline to one that's slightly less untrue, but only slightly. Now it reads, drinking tea and wine could keep flu at bay. Guess what the study in question did not involve? Wine. That's right. No wine was harmed or even consumed in the course of this particular study. No tea either, for that matter. The researchers were testing the effects of resveratrol, a compound that's found, yes, in wine and tea, but also in grape juice and blueberries and peanuts and various other foods. The experiments were being done on mice, and the resveratrol did not keep the mice from getting the flu, because all of the unfortunate mice in this study already had the flu, thanks to the researchers who intentionally infected them. But the resveratrol treatment did seem to help the mice fight off the infection a little bit better. This is not the first study to suggest that resveratrol might be useful in fighting influenza and other viruses, by the way. And there's even research to suggest that moderate consumption of red wine could reduce your chances of catching the common cold. But should you come down with the flu, drinking wine is not recommended. For one thing, You'd probably die of alcohol poisoning long before you got to the amount of resveratrol that's being tested in these studies. But meanwhile, drinking alcoholic beverages will dehydrate you, and that's going to make you feel worse, not better. If you wanted to increase your resveratrol intake, just in case, drink tea or grape juice or eat some peanuts. It may not help, but at least it won't hurt. Taking a vitamin D supplement could offer modest protection against the flu. When they examined studies involving more than 10,000 people, researchers found that taking a vitamin D supplement reduced cold and flu infections by about 10%. But among those who were low in vitamin D to begin with, taking a supplement reduced infection by a much more encouraging 50%. Now, vitamin D is inexpensive, it's exceedingly safe, and it has other benefits, such as helping build strong bones. And low vitamin D levels are extremely common, especially during the winter, otherwise known as flu season. Although it's not a magic bullet against the flu, I'd say that a vitamin D supplement is kind of a no-brainer. Probiotic foods and supplements might also offer a bit of extra protection. In a review of about a dozen studies, researchers found that probiotic supplements cut the risk of cold and flu almost in half, and for those who did get sick, it trimmed a few extra days off their recovery. The caveat here is that the available studies weren't of the best quality, and they weren't all testing the same probiotic. There are thousands of strains of friendly bacteria out there, and they don't all have the same benefits. Some might be better at protecting against infection than others. This is why my strategy is to eat a variety of probiotic foods, including yogurt and kefir, but also miso and fermented vegetables. I figure the more different probiotic foods you consume, the wider the variety of microbes you're exposed to, and the better your chances of getting the right ones. In fact, some studies suggest that the diversity of your gut population might be more important than which specific bugs you have on board. But once you've stocked that pond, you need to be sure to feed the fish, as it were. And that's why it's equally important to eat plenty of prebiotic foods as well. And those include legumes, nuts, whole grains, and other sources of fiber that provide sustenance for those friendly bacteria. Whenever flu season comes around, I get lots of questions about which foods and nutrients will help build up our immune response. 
but I think we often focus too much on bolstering our immune system and not enough on reducing the number of bugs that our immune system will need to protect us from. By far, the most effective strategy for reducing your risk of getting sick is to limit your contact with sick people. This is easier said than done, of course, because unfortunately, a lot of people continue to go to work and school and attend social events and concerts and movies and board planes, even when they're not feeling well. If you are getting sick, you can do your boss, clients, customers, students, teachers, friends, and neighbors a huge favor by staying out of public, especially during those first three or four days of your illness when you're likely to be most contagious. Now, if someone in your household gets sick, there's only so much you can do to keep your distance, but at least you have the advantage of knowing that they are sick. So try to avoid sharing cups and glasses and even hand towels and dish towels. Keep a canister of disinfecting wipes on the counter in the kitchen and the bathroom and wipe those surfaces down regularly until everyone's feeling better. Now, employers, teachers, and pastors could help reduce the rate of flu infection a lot by actively encouraging people not to drag themselves to work, school, or church when they're sick. You are not a hero for showing up to the meeting and then infecting everyone there. And I also wish that businesses that have strict cancellation policies would consider a more lenient policy during active flu season so that people aren't showing up sick for their appointments in order to avoid forfeiting their fees. I realize that this clemency could be abused, but I think having employees and customers show up sick ultimately costs businesses way more than having a couple of healthy people call in sick. Unfortunately, not everyone sees it this way, and a good percentage of the people you're going to come into contact with this week are going to be sick. Flu and cold viruses travel through the air, so if you notice someone coughing or sneezing, try to keep your distance. And if they're not polite or aware enough to cover their coughs and sneezes properly, and that is not with their hands then try to cover your nose and mouth with a scarf or a clean tissue. And germs can also be transferred from contaminated surfaces to your nose, mouth, and eyes via your hands and fingers. Now, those hand sanitizing gels that we see everywhere these days, they're better than nothing. But believe it or not, careful hand washing with just plain old soap and water is the best way to decontaminate your hands. So, Take advantage of every opportunity you get. And take heart. The flu season usually begins to abate in early spring, which is just a few weeks away. You'll find a transcript of today's show, including links to all those studies I mentioned and several related Nutrition Diva episodes at nutritiondiva.quickanddirtytips.com. If you have comments or questions or a suggestion for a future podcast topic, you can post them on our website or on the Nutrition Diva Facebook page, where I also do live nutrition Q&A sessions on Friday afternoons. Check the events tab on the page for the schedule and stop by if you can. And you can also see videos of previous sessions in the videos tab. Thanks for listening and have a great week.